The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome. Any visitors, grateful to have you uh, here with us to worship the living God. Um, Duke and Ellie got married yesterday. It was a beautiful ceremony and so uh, grateful how the Lord has met them and just the beautiful foundation that was laid uh, in Christ in their journey. Uh, This morning is a special Lord's Day. We're going to remember Christ's sacrificial death for us on our behalf as we come to the table. And so what what a privilege as we sang that last song. That's really all I would care is give me Christ. Give me all of Him, all of His fullness, all of His beauty. That's all that I've been seeing in this chapter 1 of Peter, and now we get to finish our service up in this section, and we'll just turn our attention and our gaze to Christ and remember once again the sweetness and the beauty of what He has done on our behalf. So what a, what a privilege uh, to gather together for this. So let's pray and ask God to meet us in a special way. Father, I pray that Your Spirit would give us the full knowledge of Christ. I pray now as we open up this word, Lord, we want to see the truth of it. And God, we desire that our affections would be stirred for this lovely one, Christ. And I pray that every will in this room would be engaged for the King of Kings. God, we look to you to do what no man can do. We pray that you would come and move in power in our midst. I pray that when we're done, every soul would just cry out, give me Jesus. God, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. God, I thank you for the way you've been meeting us in this section, and I pray this morning, Lord, that you would now open up this word, illuminate it to the minds and the hearts of your people so that they would be edified, encouraged, and strengthened, and full of hope. God, we thank you for Christ, and it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. If you'll turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, we're currently looking at verses 3 through 11. Uh, The assurance of salvation, the desire to have full assurance in this gospel that it's mine and I will indeed inherit eternal life. And we've broken it down into two kind of main components as we've been journeying. In the first section, uh, in verses 1 through 4, we've been seeing that the, the gospel is the gift of faith, that God grants you the ability to see and believe and love this gospel. It goes from just knowledge when God gives you faith, and now it becomes the treasure to you. It's your heart, your life. You believe this. It's changing you. You live different. You have the gift of faith to see Christ in all of his fullness. Epigenosis is what we've been looking at, the the full knowledge of God. And so this gift of faith, is you, you see that. You see his righteousness, we saw, that is now put to your account. This morning you are clothed by faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we're given precious and magnificent promises. Promises that are unbelievable unbelievable and unfathomable. That he said that the conclusion of all these promises is this hint clause. The purpose is that you would be partakers of the divine nature. That we now can have The Greek word was koinonia, to to share, to participate, to be one with. We now are partakers of the divine nature through this gospel. You're brought back into the presence of God and all the fullness to share with Him in relationship with Him. The gospel is the power now then in Christ to overcome our lusts at the end of verse 4. All these desires that controlled us in the world, now we have a greater desire, a greater passion driving that out. And it's the beauty and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ that we spend all of our days in this Word looking, believing, gazing at, and beholding our Christ. Second section. Now our desire then is to be like Him. This is how you know if you've been born again. When you see this gospel, I just want to be conformed to the image of the Christ that I have seen with my epigenosis, with this faith that has been given to me, and I want to look like him. I want to walk like him and speak and think and always do the things that are pleasing to the Father. My will is, is, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That is the new birth that's been put into our heart, and now the pursuit of the Christian life 
is conformity to Christ. That is now within every heart. I want to be conformed to Christ. And Peter says we're to be diligent. He, he bookends this whole thing with that word then, is now we're, we are diligent to add to our faith. So faith is what we've been looking at for so long in the gospel, the finished work. We see the glory of Christ, but now he's saying that this isn't to get saved, you're adding to your faith. This is now going to come out of those who believe, and faith now has works. Faith works, and Christ-like character and virtue now are what we are about. We're, We're hunting it down, we're pursuing after it, we desire it. The gift of faith has to have this attached to it. If you are going after this, Peter says you will be slowly growing in the graces that we will look at this morning. And then you're going to make certain, he said, your calling and your election. That God has indeed called you out and given you this faith. These evidences are going to give you the full assurance, it's mine. It's been given to me and it's working and it's changing me. Apathy, no concern passivity toward Christ's likeness takes away assurance. And Peter says you become unfruitful and worthless. You quit seeking after conformity to Christ and you're going to quit bearing any kind of fruit and you'll, you'll be like salt, trampled out and good for nothing. And so this is so essential that we do not lose sight of the, what, what faith gives birth to and gives life to in the Christian life. So we are looking at verses 1 through 4, that empower and enable us to live the lives of verses 5 through 8. The power of the gospel, the power of of true knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, and seeing it and beholding it is going to transform and change your life. And that's why we came to verse 5, now for this very reason also, which would be like therefore. Because of the truth of the finished work, all of grace, what he has done, therefore, now for this very reason also, apply all diligence. Go after this conformity to Jesus Christ. Be diligent. Diligence. I want this. I'm given to this. I'm not just floating around hoping I wake up holy one day. I just hope I'll become like Jesus Christ by sitting on my couch doing nothing. This is a diligence, a call to pursuing Christ's likeness. So add to your faith. And this is Galatians. The whole book says that faith works by love. It walks by love. And so this faith in verses 1 through 4 is going to produce a life of love. And that's where Peter will finish up uh, in these verses this morning. So add to your faith. Faith rests in the finished work of Christ. It's finished. To Tetelestai. Faith has found a resting place in Christ, a fellowship, a koinonia, a oneness, partaking. And it's so sweet. Peter says, now add to it. There's nothing in the way of justification or oneness that we're trying to earn. But add to that faith that is not alone. A faith that empowers and sets our heart aflame to want to be like Jesus Christ. Guys, to be diligent to grow in these qualities. It's what I'm about. I'm not a spiritual couch potato. I'm not passive in my sanctification. Our efforts are insufficient to ever change us, but our efforts are necessary for our growth and how God has designed how He works out salvation and sanctification in our lives. This is the balance that every soul in this room must find. And I I spend my whole life falling off the razor's edge on either side. (laughs) And Peter's going to say, here it is. This is what it looks like in the Christian life. This is the balance that we must find if we're ever going to grow in grace and peace in verse 2. This is the true knowledge of Christ. It's a knowledge that wants conformity to Him. And it's pursuing it over anything else in this world. I want it more than my lusts. I want it more than money. I want this more than good health. I want it more than power, retirement, approval, my children doing great. I I want this more than any other desire that I have in my heart. 
And so the clarion call this morning from Peter is to individual and universal pursuit of Christ-likeness. We are all going after this individually and as a body to help each other and push each other onward, onward, keep going, conformity to Christ. This is the beauty and the need of the church today. And I tell you, this will not just come by simply wishing it or hoping it. This is a call to rest in Christ completely and to be absolutely diligent to look like this Christ. Amen? It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call to be absolutely diligent as I'm resting completely in the fullness of this gospel. So let's take it up, saints of God. I'm going to give you just a couple observations as we begin looking at this list. Uh, It begins in verse 5. He'll talk about moral excellence and knowledge. (coughs) And we'll journey through all these. And what I want you to see just as we start, these are not sequential. They're they're not building blocks. Okay, you get moral excellence and now you can proceed to knowledge. And that that is not what it is that you get one and go on to the next. Here you pass uh, moral excellence, now you get to move on to knowledge. That's not what Peter's talking about. These are called a locative of sphere. And these are the spheres of the Christian life that we are to be growing in. True Christians don't stop growing in Christ's likeness. You're never to be content with where you're at. You're not to live in the good old days. You're just never content, pushing, moving. One scholar said this, he said the little Greek would be translated like this. If we stand in our faith, apply yourself to live the life of faith. The just shall live by faith. Apply yourselves in your faith to live in moral excellence. Strive to increase in your knowledge. Strive to have self-control over your passions. Strive for patience with all men. Don't be satisfied where you are at and strive for godliness. Press on for the affection of this whole body. And, And above all, Love for all men, even your enemies. There it is. And so I want to look at these qualities this morning. And and I love this list. The more time I spend meditating on it, it just keeps exploding in different ways. I want you this week to get in the secret place and pray for epigenosis. And just look at this list and start praying, God, let me get it. Let me see it in a way that these start growing and growing forming and uh, becoming more and more in my life. Get in there. I'm telling you, God will meet you and he will help you. And so seek these, be diligent. And let's look at them then. Seven virtues to be pursued. And they're not exhaustive, but they're the list that Peter will give us and they cover a lot of the Christian life. So begin with me in verse five. In your faith, supply moral excellence. It, It means virtue. I like the word Integrity. This word was used in classical times where God gives ability to perform heroic deeds. So it it, it would come to men and they would do something that caused them to stand out from the rest. You'd say, wow, there's there's God. And they they called it moral excellence. And it's it's a quality that you have. And it literally meant to a proper and excellent fulfillment of something. Excellent, like a knife that can cut really well, or a horse that can run really fast, a singer who just sings beautifully. And so it meant an operative virtue, not just an attitude. It isn't just, I got an attitude. This is something that's worked out and it's seen. It's a moral excellence demonstrated in your life. And you stand out from this world that's driven by its lusts and its desires. It, it, it's a goodness. It, it's, how, do, how would people describe you? Go to work. How would you describe me? Ask your spouse. How would you describe me? Ask your son. How would you describe me? Barnabas, it said he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit. That's the word. It's the, the picture of that. It truly, in one word, if I could bring it, I'd say Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. Moral excellence. Paul said, one thing I do, I press on toward the mark. I'm reaching forward for excellence, conformity to Christ, moral excellence, excel still more in it. And so who are you? 
What are you about when nobody is looking? And so this is, this is our moral excellence and what Peter is saying, you, we're striving to grow in this. I, I just, because of Christ and this gospel and when I see his beauty, I want moral excellence. I, I, I want to be growing in this moral excellence because of all that I have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that filling your heart? Just, or, or is it immoral apathy? What, what, what's driving and are you growing in and becoming more of this should be a, a group that what keeps growing is moral excellence at Southside Bible Church. And then, this is what I want you to add, in your faith, supply moral excellence. And then in verse 5, in your moral excellence, knowledge. Moral excellence needs knowledge. This is a, a discernment. What, what is the excellent path or choice that I should walk in? If I don't know the Word of God, I will never have moral excellence. I need to know what, what is the path that will glorify God. I need to, to grow in my knowledge. Gnosis, a practical, experiential understanding. I'm, I'm learning truth and it's working its way out into my life. This is knowledge that is understood. You must get knowledge. You've got to learn it. It needs to be applied. And the goal of our instruction is love from a sincere and pure heart. So he's saying get knowledge, but you've got to get it and you've got to live it. So many people in the Christian life think knowledge is the end goal. I, I, I was kind of taught that if you just learn all the doctrines, that's the end goal. And I'm telling you, epigenosis, is, that is not the end goal. It's a goal. I've got to get knowledge. I've got to be growing. But it better be leading me to God. It better be leading me to a life that's learning how to live in a way that glorifies and pleases that God. I want to walk the way Christ walked. So I'm begging you, don't let knowledge just stop. Let it get into your life where it produces moral excellence. And it produces a, a knowledge of Christ, an intimacy, a relationship a oneness. And I, I know there's some who are sitting here in just knowledge. And it hasn't ever produced epigenosis and it's never produced moral excellence. And I, I want you to, this morning to repent of having stopped at knowledge and not come all the way to Christ. And so some of you even this morning need to come to Jesus Christ and quit resting in knowledge and come rest in Him and Him alone. And I'll tell you, knowledge is necessary <laughs> to get you to that place. And so seek knowledge that you might behold your God and start living like your God. We must know it before we can live it. This is a call to labor over the Word of God, to learn it and to understand it and to apply it into your daily life. Does this knowledge work with how you treat your wife? Is this knowledge of affect the way you work with your kids or your workmates or your neighbor, your church members? How do, you, how do you deal with church members when they don't act the way you want or they hurt you? How does this knowledge coming with your anger? That's what you begin to ask. What is it doing? Is it getting in and is it changing me? That's what Peter's after. Get this truth. You will not grow by just listening to music. Labor over this word. Stand on the shoulders of great men and women who have gone before us and written insights in the Christian life after long times of meditating and seeking their God. Deep fellowship with those who are finding the depths of God's truth and His love. Get with them. Learn. Glean. We must be given to grow in the knowledge of this word, but don't let it get stuck there. Get to true knowledge that will make you like Jesus Christ. So I'm begging that you're growing in true knowledge and not just academic knowledge. You're growing in it. It's changing and it is affecting the way you live this thing out to put on the glory of God by your life. Verse 6. And in your knowledge, self-control. This word means to control your passions, not to be controlled by them. Probably one of the greatest calls to the American culture. Not to be controlled by your passions, but to control your passions. To break the will of sin. To break the will of sin. This has got to take place if you will ever make progress in true conformity to Jesus Christ. 
You will never grow into His image if all you do is chase your lusts and your desires and you have no control over them. You'll learn and learn and you'll be like a gerbil on a wheel. You will never get anywhere if you don't begin to, to be able to control your lust through the power of the Holy Spirit through these truths. We live in a land that is out of control. You spend money to get out of control. And if it feels right, do it. Don't deny anything. It's wrong to suppress your will in any way. In parenting especially, do not suppress those little kids' wills. <laughs> you will not like what that grows up into. And so this is a call to suppress the will. The, world, the word was used in athletics of, of an Olympic athlete, a runner. And they would beat their bodies for one race. The diligence of what they would eat and how they would train and what they would abstain from. They would control their passions so they could run the best race that was set before them. That is us. We're controlling these passions and we're getting to run the race that has been set before us by God. And the false teachers in the next chapter come and they preach licentiousness. They say, go, go live with no self-control. Live any way you want. The gospel has set you free. You're free to just go sin and drink up this world. This is about controlling fleshly desires but what, by what I know about truth. Moral excellence. And so it's a call to get a grip on yourself. It's not a call to be out of control. Get control over your temper. Just don't let it fly whenever you feel like it. Impure thoughts. To not to say, oh, I live in America, everyone does this. No. I get self-control over these things. I just, it, my mind's not going to go there. Jealousy and anger. Even digging in and fellowship. This virtue, this quality of self-control comes as a result of His promises, is what He said, these, these magnificent promises. I have everything in Christ. If you are not abiding in that, you can work as much as you want and you will never get self-control. There's only one way. Every time your lusts want something, you will grab it. Give me it. That's a, that, that's a fruit. Fruit of faith is to say, I got something better. I, I've got Christ, and I live in that awareness and that reality. And so the, the, the temptations that come, I'm telling you, the, the beauties of Christ will drive those out. That's what he said in verse 4. He'll drive out your epithumias, your over-desires. And so this is the, the call to self-control. I, I've got to be full in Christ or I'll just keep drinking up everything this world offers and throws at me as a better alternative to Christ. America's been trained, if you want it, grab it. You only go around once and you deserve a break today. All marketing is to push you to have no self-control. Don't wait until you have enough money. Buy it now. You need it. Uh, our food portions are ridiculous. Everything, we have to grow in self-control. And, and Peter's saying, I have to be diligent to not let my epithumias, my over-desires, drive my choices in life. And this is so foreign to many today and even in the church. It's the air we breathe. It's going to take diligence to add to your faith a self-control. And then he says to the self-control, I want you to add perseverance. This word is hupomeno. Meno means to abide, and hupo means under. And so this is someone who can abide under. They, they, they don't come out from the hardness and the trials and the difficulties and the truth. They, they, they stay under it. It's perseverance. And so this is it. We, we, we do not have three days of fighting. I, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesdays are my best three days of the week. And then I just let loose on the weekends. <laughs> my self-control falls apart. Everything's done. But those first three days, I do great. Sundays are my best days. So what he's saying is we're not just shooting stars. We're not just driven by our circumstances and by our emotions. You can't be. How we feel. I just don't feel like reading. I don't feel like saying no to temptations. He's saying this is what we've got to grow in, saints of God. This is so important that we lay hold of this. We persevere in this truth. One through four. Gospel Diligent now to have Christ's likeness. This is not the one who sets out 
But the gospel is it's the one who holds out, and by the grace of God, every child will hold out. But the call to us is to be diligent, to not let go. This does not save you, but it proves if you've been saved. Wake up. Let's fight. There's a battle to lay hold of this and don't sell it for anything. We need each other, and he'll grow it into a mighty oak, and he'll break through the cement of your hard heart and these epithemias that are controlling your life, that this gospel will break through that. The power to be changed as we sang from the inside out our desires and what we love and to begin to change the way we live and walk in this world. I want you to hear this. We need to be growing in these. We need to be adding to these. And it's not the perfection, but it is the direction of our lives. This has to be what we give our lives to. And so I'll ask you, child of God, are you? If not, that's why you don't have real, vibrant assurance. And that's why you've grown cold in the Christian life. The evidence of God's power in your life is not perfection. But this morning, are you swimming? Are you stroking to the boat called Christ-likeness? Is that the one thing that you're pressing on toward? Are you stroking, even if you're going nowhere against the current? I just can't quit swimming toward that goal. Look with me in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are what? Increasing. They need to be increasing. What happens then? They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the epigenosis of our Lord Jesus Christ, the true full knowledge of Christ. It will produce this. So if you're not growing in these qualities, you're going to be useless. Who Raise your hand if you want to be useless for the kingdom of God. Just no one. You're going to be unfruitful. I want to bear fruit. I want to be a branch with fruit on it. That's what's going to happen. There'll be none. Dried up little berries all over your limbs. In verse 9, you start the Christian life so it's so important, as many of us began the Christian life like an Olympian. Man, when you first get saved, what do you do? You're Mark Spitz or Michael Phelps of Christianity. And you're in there just swimming. And then there's this slow fade. And Psalm 1 says you start walking with the, with the evil and you, you stand and counsel with them. And then you sit in the seat of scoffers. And the next thing you know, you're even mocking those who are swimming hard after Jesus. This life was harder than I thought. And your, your remaining sin is fighting you this morning. And there's a real devil. And there's a real world trying to conform you to its image. And you have just started floating. And what happens when you float against this current? You're, you're going downstream. And that's all that's happening. And you're, you're starting maybe this morning, God's waking you up to say, you have floated so far downstream that that list doesn't even exist in your life. Just floating, meandering, and you've quit stroking. And now you're just miles and miles away from the sweetness of being a partaker of the divine nature. It's like, Pastor, I don't even know what you're talking about when you say those words. You've lost that. Precious and magnificent promises of God are so far from your heart that now every lust is just a match on dry kindling. You've just drifted. What do you do? Is there hope for you this morning? Look at verse 9. For he or she who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. Having forgotten his purifications from his former sins. You forgot the gospel. This gospel is too precious and magnificent to let it be cold and stale and sit on the outside of your life. You forgot when you came to Jesus for that cleansing flood and you were washed in the blood of the Lamb, forgiven all those sins that were weighing, killing you, and guilt and shame, washed, gone. 
to the beauty of that relief when you realize, I cannot believe my, not my sins in part, but the whole were nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. You forgot it. You let that go. You, you let other things crowd in and choke out the most beautiful, essential thing of this world. Other desires have gotten bigger and bigger than that I may know Him and be like Him. You got bigger desires than that this morning. And that's what's happened. <clears throat> you lost the gospel. You let it become stale. You didn't get in this word and fight for epigenosis. Let me look at this day in and day out. Keep this gospel alive and fresh in my heart. Don't let it dry up. Oh God, I need help. Give me the body of Christ. Give me preaching. Give me teaching. I need everything Keep this heart supple and tender at the cross of Jesus Christ. Peter says, you forgot. You forgot that your past sins were forgiven. And you're wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ because your own was so insufficient. You forgot the present power that can change us truly from the inside to the outside. There is a power. Christianity that all world religions and moral reform do not have. There is a power to be changed. And it's in Jesus Christ. And you forgot your future. You forgot verse 11. In this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Just enter in. You're gonna, you're, it's going to be abundantly supplied when you come in Jesus Christ and have lived this kind of a life and never grew weary of seeking conformity to Christ and resting in His promises and abiding in the divine nature. Abundant. So what's the reward for not giving up and striving and, and having hupomeno and abiding under the trials of burying spouses and kids? What, what is the reward that I never let go of Jesus? abundantly supplied to dwell with Him forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth. That's faith. You were given the gift of faith. That's the reward. Faith perseveres and endures for the reward. The promise. Have you forgotten your future and what really matters? Your future is not your retirement. Your future is the kingdom being abundantly supplied. That's what you're after. And he says you forgot your past, your present, and your future. Remember, you got to remember the purification of your former sins. Remember Jesus hanging on a cross and dying in your place for all the sins that you personally committed against God so that the, the just one could be merciful and forgive your sins. Verse 10, Therefore, you remember these things, brethren, then be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and His choosing you, His election, that God has indeed set His grace on you. You better be diligent to make sure. For as long as you practice these things, you're going to never stumble. This is the way into the eternal kingdom. And the one who wants to just sit here and pull a Romans 6 and say, I'm just going to sin that grace may abound, your condemnation will be just. But the one who's tasted grace, I won't let go. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. I'm going to persevere in conformity to Him and believing these promises that are precious and magnificent to keep fueling my, my life and my perseverance and my battle and my hope and, and my strength. My strength will never get any of these, but His power, will, working through as I believe these things, will empower my diligence and my perseverance in this whole list. Striving for these things is evidence that the promises of God have gotten into your hearts. They're epigenosis now. They're not just these things that you've learned. God put them in your heart. And I've heard some of your testimonies, and there's a couple of you that it didn't get into your heart. This morning I'm praying that this will get into your heart, and you'll see that this will tutor you to Christ because you have to be honest before God. You don't have a relationship with Him. The beauties of these promises, they're not magnificent and precious to you. And you're not being changed or conformed to the image of Christ. Jesus is saying, will you come to me this morning? You've got to be weary and heavy laden trying to change yourself in that list and getting nowhere. 
Come to me and I'll give you rest for your souls and then I'll give you power to start becoming this. That's the offer for any unbeliever here this morning. Believers, I can't quit swimming after this. I want to be like Peter. Where else can I go? You alone have the words of life. I will not go away. You can't quit. And I'll be honest with you, I have seasons of dullness. I have seasons where I stumble. And I have seasons of coldness. But he always restores my soul. And it's by verses 1 through 4. He restores my soul by looking again at Christ, seeing his beauty, and all the apathy and coldness, it just falls off when I see him again in all his glory and his beauty. And he leads me then into the paths of righteousness, verses 5 through 7. And so guys, are you making every effort to grow in moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and agape? And some of you might have to answer no. And so my prayer for all of us is that he would wake us up to seeing that the glory of the gospel makes you stroke. It's his power. It's him causing you to will and to do his good pleasure. But I, I, I can't lose sight that I've got to be diligent to grow in these things. If you're not stroke and you forgot the precious, magnificent promises, the cross, they become heirlooms, you just forgot. And this morning now we're going to remember that Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he inaugurated the Lord's Supper for his children, his brethren, which is to heal our slow fade from these promises and let them rule and reign in our hearts again. And so this morning, what I want you to be encouraged with, it's not a long journey back if, if you floated. You let yourself go and you're so far downstream. It's not go do ten penances and light these candles and do these things. Go do this much for the kingdom of God now and then you can feel forgiven. Jesus says it's as simple as remembering. And he's going to say this morning, do this in remembrance of me. To remember again that he, he was poured out for our drifting and not being diligent and wandering and letting him become simple. He died for that. Let the table this morning peel off that callus that's caused you to drift from the sweetness of what God has given us in Christ and will. And a cold knowledge that's just replaced epigenosis. It's just cold and sterile and it's no longer full and in the fullness and realness of Christ. Fall on the sweetness and the sufficiency of our Savior. Remember that His body was broken and His blood was poured out for your sin. For the sin of forgetting and getting distracted in this life and the things of it and the scene. Sweeten your heart again in Christ. The Christ of new beginnings and healings in our hearts, in our driftings, in our wanderings. What a Savior. And I would that all of you this morning would have full assurance. Believe the gospel by its power. Be diligent to grow in the graces of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, until we abundantly enter in to the kingdom of God. And I'm just going to close out with a couple quotes from my friend John Newton, uh, and then we'll, we'll come to the table. He said, Wonderful are the effects when a crucified, glorious Savior is presented by the power of the Spirit in the light of the Word to the eye of faith. It is so beautiful when Christ crucified is put before your eyes and God gives you the gift of faith to see. This sight destroys the love of sin. It heals the wounds of guilt. I feel so guilty. It softens the hard heart and it fills the soul with peace, life, and joy and makes obedience practical, desirable, and pleasant. If we could see this more, we would look less at other things. But alas, unbelief places a veil before our sight, and worldly-mindedness draws our eyes another way. A desire to be something that we're not, or to possess something that we don't have, or to do something that we cannot do, 
some vain hope, some vain fear or vain delight comes in like a black cloud and it hides the beloved Christ from our eyes. Things come into our lives that you want and desire and got to have and it's this big cloud that's blocking you from seeing the beauty and the brilliance and the glory of Christ. He says, this shows what poor creatures we are, notwithstanding our hope that we are converted. He said, we need a new conversion every day. Which for Newton was the transforming power of a living sight of Christ by faith in the gospel every day. Every day I need to look at this gospel again and see the beauty of God in the face of Christ. Because there's so many things battling against it. Newton said, this is the hardest thing I've ever done to simply gaze at Christ. There's so many distractions and battles and fights. And this morning we're going to come to the table and just bring all of our focuses back to the glory and beauty of Christ, Christ alone. Isn't he lovely? I've been journeying in this for 32 years. And my conclusion after 32 years, it's all of, it's all of Christ. <laughs> Everything. He's done it all. He's beautiful. He's the source. He's where we look. He's our hope. He's our power. It's just Christ is altogether lovely. Make it about him. Grow in your love and knowledge of him. And then seek to be like him. It's just Christ. There's just nothing more or less. It's all of him. And I'll read my last poem because I've gone so long. I'm going to be in trouble with some of the, the authority in this church. And, and some without authority. So <clears throat> here's my last poem by Newton and we'll go to the cross. In evil long I took delight. Boy, did he ever. Unawed by shame or fear. Till a new object struck my sight and stopped my wild career of sin. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word was spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now all my tears are vain. Where, where shall my trembling soul be hid? For I the Lord have slain. A second look he gave me, Christ, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that thou mayst live. With pleasing grief and mournful joy, my spirit now is filled, that I should such a life destroy, yet live by him I killed. I pray that we would remember again the forgiveness of sins that we found in Jesus Christ. Let's Come to the table, I'm going to pray, and then we'll pass out the elements and have communion together. Father, thank you for the glory and the beauty of this section. Thank you for what we have seen. I pray that you will perfectly apply it to every heart. I pray that, that all would look to Christ this morning now. God, that you would bring fresh and remind every one of us again of our only hope and the, the most beautiful thing of a body broken and blood spilled out for our forgiveness and our ability to, to be partakers of the divine nature. God, thank you for such a sacrifice. Let, let our hearts be stirred again to want to run after him with everything of our being. Let it be that power that comes through Christ, enabling and, and stirring affection for conformity to our Christ. God, let these be growing in every soul here this morning, I pray. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.